and good morning. Well, unless you're watching this in the afternoon, then good afternoon. Um, I'm in the library today, so there might be some background chatter while we're doing this, but hopefully not too much. Uh, so we'll start off with some sample diploma board questions. Uh, so an electron in a lithium atom drops from N3 down to N1 energy level. The frequency of the photon is emitted. So we're dropping down from N3 to N1. And we have to find the energy difference in between. Remember, just get rid of those um, negatives on there. So we just go 5.1 minus 1.7 and because I'm in the library I don't have my on-screen calculator but I'm sure you can figure out this one um, so the the photon that would be emitted as a drop down would have an energy of 3.4 electron volts the difference in between them so all we have to do is uh, E equals uh, oops equals HF is all we have to do and just take our energy divided by h so we divide it by our electron volt one 4.14 times 10 to the negative 15 electron volt seconds and we get 8.2 times 10 to the 14 so c is the correct answer uh, this one um it's asking for the energy level of m uh, this one's a little bit trickier because this is where the negative comes into effect and you really have to think about it right um, so remember that this top level here right if these are the different levels that aren't shown here the top level is zero energy right so you have to think that well excluding the negative it's going to have a negative there but it's going to get closer to zero so what we have to find is we have to find the energy level difference in between here so we're going to use e equals hc over lambda and then we're going to use our electron volt one so our 4.14 so if we go 4.14 times 10 to the negative 15 times the speed of light divided by that wavelength that's given off so 589 times 10 to the negative 9 meters um, let's see what that gives us so 4.14 times 10 to the negative 15 times the speed of light divided by 589 times 10 to the negative 9 and we get the energy difference is 2.10865 electron volts right so we want a number that's closer to zero so what I would do is I would take uh, 514 I'd minus the 2.108 six five electron volts and I get negative three point zero three is my answer so the negative is already there never put a negative into a numeric response so your numeric response answer would be three point zero three is the answer eleven the absorption spectrum hydrogen is produced uh, so an absorption spectrum is when we get all the colors red orange yellow green, blue, indigo, violet, but what's missing is those gaps. So the way we get those gaps is if this is the energy levels of the atom, right? That photon comes in and only photons that have the specific frequency, specific energy to make it jump up to there, jump up to there, jump up to there, like that are absorbed. And that's what we're seeing is the dark lines. So those dark lines are when they jump from a lower orbital to a higher orbital. So D is the correct answer. Okay, in this number 11, uh, would, which of the following rules matches the tr tran transition corresponding to violet light and the frequency of the photon corresponding to violet? So we know that, um, well, what I would do in the beginning here is I would use C equals lambda F. I don't know violet light in frequencies, but I do know it in wavelength. So I'm going to take the speed of light and divide it by these frequencies. So 3 times 10 to the 8 divided by, this is the frequency I'm going to use, 7.44 times 10 to the 14. So this gives me a wavelength of roughly 400 or 403 nanometers, um, which, is, which is violet light, right? If I type in this one, so I go to the speed of light divided by 
0.47 times 10 to the 14, I get 671 nanometers, which is uh, would be reddish light. So this means that this one is not going to be violet. So this is uh, the frequency of violet light. Okay. Um, I also know that violet light is a higher energy because um, I would kind of <laughs> guess and test for this one. So it's either five or one. Um, so I'm, I'm guessing it's going to be five because this is a bigger jump. So I'm going to find the energy difference between these. So I'll go 3.64, which is this one, and I'll subtract 0 0.56. So 3.64 minus 0 0.56. And it's 3.08 as the energy for that. And then I'll just go E equals HF and check that that's the right uh, frequency. This is the right frequency for that energy jump there. So I'll take this and divide it by the 4.14 times 10 to the negative 15. And I get... Yeah, 744. So it would be the jump from 5. If you check the 1, it, it's probably going to match up with that one, but that's not violet light. Okay, so C is the correct answer. Okay, and this one here, uh, there's, there's a lot of reading with this one. So as you go through it, you probably read the whole thing. Uh, but actually, all we need is this right here. So the ionization energy for the atom. So the maximum wavelength of the photon capable of ionizing the atom. Uh, it's just E equals hc over lambda and we want to find the wavelength so we go over e so we, again we'd use 4.14 times 10 to the negative 15 times the speed of light divided by this energy and we can find the maximum wavelength so 4.14 times 10 to the negative 15 times 3 times 10 to the 8 divided by 15.7 and we get um, 7.91 times 10 to the negative 8. So 7, 9, 1, 8 as the correct answer. That's a 9. Okay. Okay. So this is actually the last lesson that we're going to do, and then we're going to uh, quiz on this stuff, and we're going to go into a review next week. So this is uh, the de Broglie, or de Broglie, if you're French, wavelength of particles. So we're going to start off with some videos here and these videos are actually like pretty wild so this first video here um is it's kind of lame the animation and stuff but it talks about a really cool experiment that actually happens and then these next two videos talk about um sort of an explanation about why it happened so let's check out these videos and here we are the granddaddy of all quantum weirdness the infamous double slit experiment. To understand this experiment, we first need to see how particles, or little balls of matter, act. If we randomly shoot a small object, say a marble, at the screen, we see a pattern on the back wall where they went through the slit and hit. Now, if we add a second slit, we would expect to see a second band duplicated to the right. Now, let's look at waves. The waves hit the slit and radiate out, striking the back wall with the most intensity directly in line with the slit. The line of brightness on the back screen shows that intensity. This is similar to the line the marbles make. But, when we add the second slit, something different happens. If the top of one wave meets the bottom of another wave, they cancel each other out. So now, there is an interference pattern on the back wall. Places where the two tops meet are the highest intensity, the bright lines, and where they cancel, there is nothing. So. When we throw things, that is, matter, through two slits, we get this, two bands of hits. And with waves, we get an interference pattern of many bands. Good so far. Now, let's go quantum. <laughs>
An electron is a tiny, tiny bit of matter. Like a tiny marble. Let's fire a stream through one slit. It behaves just like the marble. A single band. So, if we shoot these tiny bits through two slits, we should get, like the marbles, two bands. What? An interference pattern. We fired electrons, tiny bits of matter, through. But we get a pattern like waves, not like little marbles. How? How could pieces of matter create an interference pattern like a wave? It doesn't make sense. But physicists are clever. They thought maybe those little balls are bouncing off each other and creating that pattern. So they decide to shoot electrons through one at a time. There is no way they could interfere with each other. But after an hour of this, the same interference pattern is seen to emerge. The conclusion is inescapable. The single electron leaves as a particle, becomes a wave of potentials, goes through both slits, and interferes with itself to hit the wall like a particle. But mathematically, it's even stranger. It goes through both slits, and it goes through neither. And it goes through just one, and it goes through just the other. All of these possibilities are in superposition with each other. But physicists were completely baffled by this. So they decided to peek and see which slit it actually goes through. They put a measuring device by one slit to see which one it went through and let it fly. <laughs> but the quantum world is far more mysterious than they could have imagined. When they observed, the electron went back to behaving like a little marble. It produced a pattern of two bands, not an interference pattern of many. The very act of measuring or observing which slit it went through meant it only went through one, not both. The electron decided to act differently, as though it was aware it was being watched. And it was here that physicists stepped forever into the strange never world of quantum events. What is matter? Marbles or waves? And waves of what? And what does an observer have to do with any of this? The observer collapsed the wave function simply by observing. We see particle-like behavior every day. Drop a ball on the ground and it follows a single trajectory. Leave your giraffe parked on the street and when you come back, it's still there, just one giraffe. And we see wave behavior too. Toot your horn and waves spread out through the air, carrying sound to the ears of anyone around. Or drive a boat through water and waves travel outwards along the surface. But when it comes to the physics of the very small, what we see is a wave-particle duality. Sometimes very small things, we're talking electrons and protons here, behave like particles. And sometimes they behave like waves, flip-floppers. For example, if you release an electron, it'll travel outward as a wave through the room, but when it hits the wall, it'll only hit in one place. You started with one electron, after all. So what if sound had a wave-particle duality? When you shouted, the sound waves would spread outwards in all directions, but only one person could hear what you said. Or when you drove your boat through the water, the waves would travel like normal, but only hit the shore in one place. Now that would make for some pretty boring surfing. In the last video, I introduced the idea that really small things act sometimes like waves and sometimes like particles. So how can we actually picture this wave-particle duality of, say, an electron? Well, imagine our electron is a speck of dust in a raindrop. We know pretty well where the speck is, at first. But when the drop hits the ground, it'll spread out like a wave, and the speck of dust will be somewhere in that wave. So the speck, our electron, is guided by the wave. But there's still only one speck, and if you actually look for it, you'll only find it in one place. The wave will also tell you how likely you are to find the speck at any one point. If the drop splits in two, you're more likely to find the speck wherever there's more water. And that's pretty much how the wave-particle duality of quantum mechanics works. 
Each particle is guided by a wave, called a wave function or pilot wave, that determines the chances it'll be in a certain place or state. Easy, right? The hard part is figuring out the movement of the waves. So we're going to talk about the things that were explained in that video. So explain qualitatively how electron diffraction provides experimental support for the de Broglie hypothesis and describe qualitatively how two slit electron interference experiment shows that quantum systems like photons and electrons may be bottled as particles or waves. So yeah, we're going to talk about how electrons can be waves, which is like, yeah. So this is the de Broglie hypothesis. So Compton verified that Einstein's hypothesis that waves had particle-like properties such as momentum. So waves could be particles. So de Broglie suggested that perhaps the opposite is true. Maybe that all particles with momentum had wave-like properties. So here's a little Schrodinger. We'll talk about Schrodinger. Uh, no one told me that I was going to have to work with her particle and wave. Hmm. So we did some... Uh, crazy mathematics. So Einstein's equation for momentum of light was a wave function, uh, was a function of its wavelength. So this is what we use to calculate the momentum of light. So de Broglie did some crazy math and he said that hmm, maybe particles with momentum had a wavelength. So oh, oh crazy math there. You rearranged it. And uh, you know, obviously so there's more than that, but uh, that's all that we're going to talk about. Okay, so uh, de Broglie was looking at the electron, but the de Broglie wavelength applies to all particles. So usually, because of the small value of Planck's constant, this wavelength is too small to detect for normal objects uh, moving at normal speeds. So um, here's an example here. So a 66.3 kilogram woman walks at one meters per second. What is, what is her wavelength, right? Technically, uh, anyone could have a wavelength. Oops. So she is. So we're going to use that P equals lambda, oops, sorry, H over lambda formula. Uh, but I'll use a de Broglie version like this. And anytime a question mentions that it's the Broglie wavelength. This is the only time you can use this for particles. Every other time it's not okay to use this for particles, but if it's the Broglie, then it's okay. Um, so momentum is mass times velocity. So I can throw mass times velocity down there. Uh, so H is 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds. And my mass, she's a 66.3 kilogram woman, and she's moving at one meter per second. So if I do this, 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34 divided by 66.3 times 1, I get 1 times 10 to the negative 35 meters. So that's how big her wavelength is. Oops, sorry, I don't know where my... I didn't realize where my camera stopped there, um, but sorry, 1.35 times 10, uh, or sorry, 1 times 10 to the negative 35 meters is the answer. Oh man, I'm off camera again. 1 times 10 to the negative 35 meters. There we go. Uh, sorry, new location, new camera. Gotta, gotta get used to it. There we go, that's a little bit better. Um, okay, so this is a very small wavelength, right? Remember that they had problems getting light to diffract. Well, imagine getting this wavelength to diffract. You'd need a, an opening that's smaller than that, which is crazy small. And just to show you how crazy small this is, because this is like a, an unfathomable number, um, I'm going to show you this here. So this is called scale of the universe. And this just shows, so it starts at times 10 to the 0, so 1 meter, and then it gets smaller. So I'm going to go smaller here. So basketball, largest virus, shrew, hummingbird, matchstick, so we're times 10 to the negative 1, marble, coffee bean, all things that we can still see. 
grain of sand, largest bacteria, that's a big bacteria, dust mite, human egg. So this is the smallest object visible to a naked eye. So you can actually see a human egg, which is weird, width of hair. And then we go things smaller, small that we can't see. So this is infrared wavelength, mist droplet, white blood cell, red blood cell. And then we get smaller wavelengths, red wavelength, violet wavelength, Y chromosome, largest virus, Mimi virus, bacteriophage, HIV, uh, ultraviolet wavelength. Transistor gate. These are things that these are switches on phones, and that's like crazy small or like electronics. Phospholipid bilayer. You remember that from grade ten. So we're at times ten to the negative nine now. Glucose, carbon atom, Mickey Mouse molecule, water molecule, <laughs> hydrogen atom, helium atom, gamma. So this is how big the nucleus is. And this is sort of what we talked about for with the, before with the Rutherford atom. So that's how big the nucleus is. And I'm going back again. And then this is how big atoms are, right? So you can see that the nucleus is way, 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 way smaller than the actual atom itself. Most of the atom is empty space. Okay, chlorine nucleus, electron, helium nucleus, so an alpha particle, proton, neutron, And then up quark, down quark, strange quarks. These are what um, protons and neutrons are made out of. Uh, we won't get a chance to talk about that. That was like the last half of this unit, but that's okay. So nothing for a long time. I'm just going to speed it up. Oh. oh, see, we're getting close to that. There we go. So Planck length, so that's times 10 to the negative 35. So that's how big the wavelength would be. And this is what theories of what everything is made of, string theory, quantum foam, but that's how small it is. So it's like crazy, crazy small. Okay, so de Broglie wavelengths do get significant for small particles like the electron, and especially if they move at very high speeds. So uh, an electron travels at this speed. Well, what's the wavelength of that? So let's do this calculation. Okay, so again, we'll use uh, lambda equals h over mv. And uh, we'll go 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds. Uh, mass of the electron, 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms. You can see how these are a lot closer. Um, and it's traveling at 7.3 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. So when I type this in, We end up getting 9.97 times 10 to the negative 11 meters. Um, so this is a lot more doable. This is actually the wavelength of x-rays. And we talked about how x-rays and um, electrons are sort of linked with uh, how, do, how we produce x-rays. So this is a lot more, a lot more doable. So the idea that high-speed electrons behave a lot like X-ray frequency was tested with the Davidson, uh, Davison Germer experiment. So in this experiment, X-rays were diffracted through a crystal, producing the char characteristic interference pattern. So they shot X-rays, which are light waves, um, more particles, but light waves, through a crystal, and they used the crystals, uh, the spacing between the the atoms of the crystal to create the diffraction pattern, the diffraction grating, and they got an interference pattern. So when high speed electrons of equal uh, de Broglie wavelengths were shot through the same crystals, you got the exact same pattern, the exact same result, right? So this is what the experiment looked like. They shot x-rays 
which we think of as light, through the crystal. The crystal has atoms arranged in a cer certain lattice, and that caused uh, them to diffract, and you got an interference pattern. So they did the same thing. They shot a particle, or what we thought was a particle, through a crystal, and it diffracted like a wave. So waves and particles are the same thing, it seems like. So with this new evidence for electrons behaving like waves, a new model had to be created to explain these results. So what de Broglie did is he modeled his atom after music and waves on a string. So we did this in physics 20, we created these standing waves, and if you increase the frequency, you get a different standing wave. And then if you increase the frequency again, you get a different standing wave. That, that was his idea behind it, which is kind of nice in a way and it's like music and the atoms behave just like music um, so it, it would just instead of having these electrons here you, you sort of have these these waves going around like this and I'll show you a simulation because my image isn't that great right and, and as they go up they get these higher modes on there and if I could show you with the standing wave which I can't that'd be nice but I'll show you the simulation anyway uh, oops, those are people's grades. Where did the simulation go? Maybe I closed it. So let me open it again. Here it is. So these are all our models of the atom, right? So you shoot light at a Dalton model and nothing happens. You shoot light at the plum pudding, the Thompson model, and sure it gets excited solar system, uh, Rutherford did not work, uh, Bohr atom worked pretty well, right, but he couldn't explain why this electron was behaving like a wave, right, in, in, in Bohr's model it explained a lot of things, but it couldn't explain that, so this is the de Broglie model, where everything looks almost exactly the same, let me slow it down a little bit here, um, but instead of it being a particle, it's a wave, and as it absorbs light, so it's going to absorb one of these photons, probably this one here, it goes to a higher level like that, and we have a different frequency and wavelength of that electron. And anytime it drops down, it emits a photon as well. So it's almost identical to the Bohr atom, but instead of it being this particle, it's this, this wave there. Yeah. So electrons are actually waves. Hmm. So problems arose almost immediately, kind of like the Rutherford model. Um, if electrons were standing waves, could they ever stop and take a picture of them? Like taking a picture of the particle, or if you ever try to stop a wave, it, the wave wouldn't be there anymore and would it crash into the nucleus? Uh, so how does, how does that even work? Um, so the de Broglie model isn't super popular. Uh, it didn't work that well. Um, so the next model that came up was Schrodinger's model. So in the 1920s, 100 years ago, Erwin, Erwin Schrodinger and Werner Heisenberg, uh, using the nat wave nature of electrons from de Broglie, independently came up with the quantum mechanical model of the atom. So from Schrodinger's, electrons' orbits became probabilistic wave equations. Okay, So uh, this shows the orbital, and then this shows the shape, and this is the probability of finding that electron in there. So he still retained Bohr's energy levels because it explained a lot so well, but Schrodinger replaced electron orbits with orbitals of various shapes at certain distance from the nucleus, and in those clouds uh, were a, a high probability of finding the electrons. So let me show you what that looks like. So this is Schrodinger's model speed it up again. So this is a certain shape when it's, at when it's at the ground state and then it absorbs an electron and it goes to these different shapes. So instead of these different energy levels, uh, it has these different clouds around it. And these clouds are, oops, let me stop it. These clouds are, are places where you can find the electron. So the electron exists in all these different areas. And until you actually try to locate the electron, it collapses the wave function and you find it. So we'll talk a little bit more about that, but it's super weird um, and confusing. So uh, in quantum mechanics, uh, what the electron is doing or where the electron is at any time is indefinite due to its wave particle nature. So um, you can't know both at the same time. 
So according to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, both the momentum and the position of the electron cannot be determined simultaneously. So this is his equation. So this is the position, and this is the momentum, and then Planck's constant divided by 2. So this is a constant right here. So what that means is, the more you know about this one, the less you know about this one. Okay, and there's a joke. So this is like a, a classic physics joke. So... Um, a driver is driving on the road and he gets pulled over, or I guess we can say Heisenberg is driving on the road and a policeman pulls him over. And the policeman goes up to the car and says, uh, sir, do you know how fast you were going? He says, no, but I know exactly where I am. Meaning that the more you know about the position, you less, less you know about the speed. So it's almost like impossible to catch the electron. Because if you know its speed, well, you don't know which direction it's going. So it could be going in any direction. And if you know its exact speed to catch it, or if you know the exact direction, you don't know the speed, so it's impossible to, to, to catch it, right? So in order to know more of one, less is known about the other, and they both equal Planck's constant. Uh, so what this means is that, well, maybe we'll never be able to see an electron. And there's some non-physics, but uh, some, I don't know, it, it goes into, uh, like, the ways you want to live your life with, with uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, but also comes into the idea of fate. And, you know, if you knew, if you knew, if, so if you had a human brain and you, human brains run on electrical impulses. So this is a human brain. So this electrical impulse goes that way. This electrical impulse goes that way. This electrical impulse goes that way. And if you had a supercomputer that could, predict how those electrons were going to move in the brain. Uh, you could predict out a person's whole life and all the decisions that they're going to make. But what this says is that you can't create a computer that knows exactly where things are going. So maybe we do have free will and maybe things aren't. There's no such thing as fate. Who knows? Um, so another thing that comes up with this is a Schrodinger's cat paradox. Um, so this is the equation. So you can find this on your formula sheet. Just kidding. Uh, none of these formulas are on a formula sheet. They're just sort of extra information. Um, but this has to do with the idea of probability. So this is just a thought experiment. This never happened. Um, but the thought experiment goes like this. So if you take a cat and you place it in a box, and inside of here, there's, there's a bunch of different ways that it's set up. But inside of here is a radioactive detector. So there's always a 50-50 chance that uh, this radioactive particle will decay or it won't decay. If it does decay, it sends an electrical impulse, uh, it trips the hammer, hammer smashes the poison and kills the cat. If it doesn't decay, well, there's no electrical impulse, it doesn't trip the hammer, it doesn't smash the poison, and it doesn't kill the cat. So there's a 50-50 chance that this cat is either dead or alive. And what Schrodinger said according to this equation is that before you check, the cat lives in this idea of a superposition where it's both alive and dead at the same time. And the act of checking on it collapses the wave function and causes the cat to either be dead or alive right? Uh, it, it, goes, it goes with that experiment about the electron diffraction. So when you send an electron through an opening, right? The, when you send the electron through the opening, it behaves as both a wave and a particle at the same time, right? But when they put the sensor here to figure out what um, opening it was going through, it behaved like a particle because you were collapsing that wave function. So until you observe it until you do that, both possibilities are possible, but but once you observe it, then only one possibility is, is possible. And again, it, this is where the idea of multiple universes, so maybe both um, universes exist where the cat is dead or alive, and then when you check it, it's dead, but in an alternate universe out there, it could be alive. It, it, it leads to all these huge, big questions. Okay, so here's one of those minute physics videos that shows Schrodinger's cat paradox and kind of explains it. Um, yeah, check it out. This wouldn't be a YouTube channel without a cat video. So without further ado, we present Schrodinger's cat. I'm sure you've heard some version of this famous thought experiment. You put a cat in a bunker with some unstable gunpowder that has a 50% chance of blowing up in the next minute and a 50% chance of doing nothing. The gunpowder is Einstein's version. Schrodinger preferred poisonous gas, but whatever. So until we look in the bunker, we don't know whether the cat is dead or alive. And when we do look, it is either dead or alive. 
So when if we repeat the experiment enough times with enough cats and bunkers and gunpowder, we'll see that half the time, Kitty survives, and half the time, Kitty goes bye-bye. The quantum mechanical interpretation is that before we look, the cat is in a superposition. It's both dead and alive. And our act of looking forces nature's decision. So our curiosity kills the cat. But what about the cat's perspective? Well, the cat either sees the gunpowder explode or not. So inside the bunker, we actually have these two possibilities. The powder explodes and the cat sees it explode, or the powder doesn't explode and the cat doesn't see it explode. There's no option, the powder explodes and the cat doesn't see it explode. So the cat's reality becomes entangled with the outcome of the experiment. And it's our observation of the experiment that forces nature to collapse to one option or the other. But we're like the cat too. Either the cat dies and we see it dead, or the cat lives and we see it alive. So who's observing us to force nature to collapse to one reality? Or do both possibilities happen in parallel within a larger multiverse? This collapsing to one reality problem is one of the biggest unanswered questions in quantum physics. So for Kitty's sake, can I has answer please? So we're going to end the course with this idea. Um, so this probabilistic view of electrons and that all matter and all matter led to Einstein's famous statement refuting quantum mechanics saying God does not place dice. So Einstein hated quantum mechanics. He hated the idea that everything is just based on probability. And it's interesting that he mentions God in it, all the things that Einstein knew he still had, uh, he could still say God, however that looked to him, right? So the quantum mechanical model is the most successful model uh, in chemistry explaining shapes of molecules and, and why atom, when atoms combine. And although it's no means a perfect model, uh, the quantum mechanical model is the best model that we have today that can explain the most things. But maybe in 20 years from now, you guys will come up with a new model of the atom that I'll be teaching one day. And uh, it'll, it'll be better than these ones, who knows. So if you're like, whoa, that was big, and I don't know what uh, I'm going to study for the test, just do these questions, and they're super easy. All this stuff is super easy. Um, but do these questions, and this is all I'm going to test you on this stuff. So none of those huge equations or anything like that. Okay. Uh, we'll do those sample diploma questions tomorrow, and if you have any questions, let me know. So let's go through these sample diploma questions. It should be pretty short and sweet. Um, so use following information answer the next questions uh, so the explanations are above are based on light having so Einstein's explanation of the photoelectric effect re re <laughs> requires light to travel in bundles uh, Young's observation of the double slit experiments requires light to interfere with itself and de Broglie's explanation of a stable atomic energy levels requires electrons to exist in standing waves um, so this is kind of like um, Young's double slit experiment is wave. Uh, this is particle, and then de Broglie's is is a wave. Um, so it's saying that light has uh, both wave and particle properties. Yeah, yeah. So see. Uh, for which of the following explanations did the diffraction of high speed electrons provide? Uh, experimental export, uh, support for, can't read today. Um, so yeah, the, the diffraction of high-speed electrons was de Broglie, and that was at uh, the wave nature of matter. Okay, and this last one, uh, solar wind in hot plasma ejected from the surface of the sun. The plasma consists in part of electrons. De Broglie hypothesized that a moving particle has a wavelength that relates to its momentum given by the formula below. So we want to find the wavelength of the solar wind. Um, okay. So momentum we can break down into mass times velocity. So if we wanted to calculate this, got a calculator today. There we go. Got the old school calculator. Um, so if you want to do de Broglie wavelength stuff, you have to use the 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34 on top, no exceptions to that. And then on the bottom, the mass of the electron. And four times 10 to the five. So. Oh, 
I did positive 34. There we go, change that to negative 34. And I should be around x-ray, like if, uh, yeah, it should be around the x-ray one, so times 10 to the nine, uh, so B is the correct answer. Okay, and that's all the questions you'll see from De Broglie on the quiz. Um, it's not, I, I'm not gonna make you calculate those Schrodinger equation things, so uh, don't worry about that.